Okay, so hey, welcome to the Consequence of Habit virtual meeting. I'm going to turn on the closed caption actually. And all are welcome here. So the mission of Consequence of Habit nonprofit is to empower individuals and communities by bringing awareness to the impact habits have on our mental health, our success, and the environment. We will have a discussion after the presentation. Here's just some of the, the guidelines um, for it. Pretty simple. It's that habits and solutions are as diverse as we are, and we respect each other and refrain from giving any unwarranted advice, interrupting each other, talking down from any sort of high ground, or directly commenting on another share. This does not mean that we can't allow what someone said, their share, to resonate with us and remind us of what our own experience is. But protect uh, privacy and confidentiality I like to say that what you hear here stays mm. here and of course you have to be nice so be kind or be gone mm. <laughs> introductions it's often it's beneficial to cultivate a community by introducing ourselves and there's no need to identify yourself by anything other than your name and if you'd like to tell us where in the world you're joining from us from that'd be great I might I probably don't have to tell you how to use zoom but if you want to know in order to unmute you use the microphone icon on the computer or the app and I don't think anyone's calling in but if you were it would be star six and I'll just go down the participants uh, list and uh, we can introduce ourselves that way so I'm Chris Norris and I am calling in from Chiang Mai Thailand Jeff would you like to introduce yourself my name is Jeff Foote, and I am calling in from Milton, Georgia, just north of Atlanta. Aaron, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Yes. Hi, everybody. I am. My name is Aaron, and I'm calling in from Southern California, and I'm excited to be part of this discussion. Thanks so much. Awesome. And Jenna, would you like to introduce yourself? Hello, I'm Jenna, and I am calling in from Media, Pennsylvania. Awesome. JT? Hey guys, this is JT and I'm in Delaware. Awesome. And Matt, if you don't have a mouthful of food, I know you were eating your dinner. <laughs> hey guys, I'm Matt Morris and I'm calling in from Virginia Beach, Virginia. And uh, this is my first Consequence of Habit um, event. So I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Glad you're here. Hey, hey, real quick, Matt, I appreciate uh, you, you jump on in here. And, and Chris, Matt is the, the guy I talked to you earlier today. Uh, awesome. And I sent you stuff. So, man, we're stoked to have you here, Matt. Yeah, cool, cool. Right on, man. Thank you. All right. So that brings us to the, um, the discussion portion. Uh, Jeff, I'll, I'll let you take it from here. I'm going to mute. Hey, Chris, thanks a lot. And everybody, thanks for, for being on. But to give you a little bit of context, my name is Jeff Foote and really 35 years doing some sort of work around environmental stewardship, whether you call it environment or sustainability or ESG, corporate su uh, sustainability. That's what I've done my entire career. And, and really when, it, when you boil it down for me, I believe that particularly in our lifestyles, but also in business, there's oftentimes a better way. And Really what I'd like to do for the next 45 minutes or so is just talk to you guys a little bit about some of the habits um, that we all can engage in to help reduce our footprint on the environment. Really to have a All right, Chris, I'm back up. I don't know if you are. You're on mute. Yeah, I'm here. Um, I think we lost our presenter. 
<laughs> hopefully he comes back in um interesting i thought it was me i was like oh no and i'm like ah, okay can anyone hear me i thought i was like um i don't know i felt like the spaceman it's like the tether had broke and i was drifting off or something okay jeff's back <laughs> jeff we, we lost you for a second you back, man. You go back on any other questions guys <laughs> sorry about that internet uh latency or, or whatever so feel free to type any questions that you uh, you may have in the chat box. Okay. So Chris, can you flip, flip me to the next slide, please? Sure. Talk a little bit about water stewardship. Only about 3% of the world's water is fresh water. And most of that, about 70% of that is actually frozen down in Antarctica. If you look at the fresh water supply that's available to us to consume, to, to bathe, to make our, make our food and to drink it is about half a percent. There's not really a whole lot of water that's available for us to consume. And when you look at, these are 8 billion people around the world, about 2 billion of those people actually are drinking water that is contaminated with feces. So huge issue with regards to contaminated water. And then when you, when you look at what's happening just in the United States, um, 60 today, 60% of the U.S. is actually experiencing drought. And Aaron, you're in Southern California. Southern Ca California is in a 1,200-year drought. It is really, really bad with regards to, to drought in California. Now, the average American uh, family uses about 300 gallons of water a day. I think on a per person basis in California is probably the lowest and it's about 70 or 80 gallons per day. But when you think about our water use in urban areas like, like LA, like Atlanta, uh, like New York, Philly, uh, about 52% of the urban water use in the US is used for landscape irrigation. And typically that's drinking water that people are using to water their, their grass and, and their flowers. And typically they overwater. Uh, and I'm sure that you've, you've been out on a run or a walk or, or cycling and you've seen somebody's sprinkler going and it's raining. It's, it's insane. We, we use water in just horrible, horrible ways. 20% of the water used in the US is for leaks. Another 20% of water, and this is probably a, a, an international number, 20% of water use is typically used to make energy. So coal fired, gas fired, when you burn fossil fuels, there is a heck of a lot of water that's used uh, to make steam to create electricity. Uh, and a lot of it gets blown off in cooling. So huge amount of water for leaks, for energy, for doing silly things like landscape irrigation. And, and who flushed the toilet today? Everybody did probably seven times. And in most areas, we're using drinking water. Remember, I just said that 2 billion people are drinking waters with feces in it. They're not drinking it out of the toilet, but we use drinking water to flush our toilets. It's, it's a design problem, but there certainly are things that, that we can do. I guarantee you everybody's had a leaky toilet in their house or a drippy faucet. And those things don't seem like a big deal, but they can add up to hundreds if not thousands of gallons of water a year. So, so when you see that leak, fix it. Um, if you do, if you have landscaping, I guarantee you, if you water a lot, you're watering it too much. Um, we've, we've survived droughts, pretty big droughts here in Georgia. We haven't used our landscaping since probably 2004. Uh, we've been in this house for 20 years and maybe the first two years we, we, we used it big drought started happening and we don't need it. The grass still, the grass still grows, uh, or in our case, the weeds still grow. So there, there's lots of things that you can, you can look for to, to reduce your water use. Um, also, if, you, if you're in, in the market for a, a new toilet, a new sink, those kind of things, there's, uh, EPA has a good program called WaterSense. And equipment that's listed as WaterSense equipment is probably going to be 30, 40, 50 percent more, more water efficient. And lots of lots of communities at the county level and the city level 
offer incentives for low flow toilets, for low flow shower heads, for low flow dishwashers, th those kind of things. So they might give you um, $25 off or $50 rebate for those kind of things. So there's lots of incentives out there that yeah, you really should, uh, should consider um, with regards to water. Uh, before I move on, I'm happy to take any questions either in the chat or even live. All right, so I'm gonna move on to, Chris, can you move me on to the next slide, please? Um, we'll talk a little bit about um, energy and climate change. Um, when I got started uh, uh, looking at climate change was probably uh, in my career in about 1992. And in 1992, there was still an incredible amount of political uh, and business debate around whether climate change, whether humans really had a, an impact on climate change. Um, but uh, I, I, was, I was lucky enough to be, do some work for the US EPA, work with some pretty good scientists and, and got a good understanding that, that climate change was um, definitely an issue and, and a big driver hap happened to be uh, human, human impact coming from uh, industry and coming from just natural uh, use by, by humans. Um, the first person that actually got, I'm sure you guys have heard of the, the greenhouse effect. Um, and that greenhouse effect, think about that our earth is covered by this very, very thin blanket. And that thin blanket, really what it does is it, it, it helps trap in some of, some of that heat. And so you've got the sun that's beating down on the ice caps, it's beating down on the oceans, it's beating down on all over the earth. And a lot of that reflects off the earth and goes back up. That blanket helps regulate the climate and it helps keep us at a, at a livable temperature. Uh, but for greenhouse gas that we put into the atmosphere that doesn't get eaten up by the ocean or eaten up by trees and agriculture to basically in photosynthesis, that blanket gets a little bit thicker and a little bit thicker. And the first person to actually scientifically figure that out and make that prediction happened in, I think in eight, I think in 1851 or 1852 in upstate New York, and the woman's name was Eunice Foote. I don't think I'm related to Eunice Foote, but the spelling of the last name is exactly the same. Being it was so long ago, um, she wasn't allowed because she was a woman, was not allowed to present the paper that and all the research she done, did herself. Her husband had to do it because she was a woman, um, unfortunately, but, but, Thankfully, her work survived and other people built off of it. But it's, it's really interesting. Every once in a while, I'll see some, something in the literature about Eunice Foote and her research and people trying to find photographs. No one's been able to find a photograph of her. Um, but, but basically, she's the first person that figured out that science and actually did scientific experiments to prove that, that if you add atmos the, the CO2 into the atmosphere or into a bell jar, it would over the thicker it got, the more you put in, the more heat it, it retained. And I think everybody's pretty familiar with, with CO2, CO2 being sort of that big culprit. Uh, but think about CO2 as, as being um, the number one. Its impact is, is, is really one on, on climate change. There, there are three other main gases that, that, are, that are impacting climate and are, are adding to that to that blanket around the earth. Um, the, the second one is methane. And methane is about 25 times uh, more impactful on climate than, than, and methane comes from a couple of sources. It comes naturally from the earth. It, it's a, it comes quite a bit from the, the, the drilling of and capturing of, of natural gas. So there's a lot of methane that comes out of that. And basically methane, natural gas is methane. Um, natural gas is actually um, a very clever term. It, make, it makes it sound really clean, but it's still a fossil fuel and still creates a, a big issue. Lots of methane is generated from, from cows, from, from their digestive system. A, a really a big, one of the big um, uh, causes of, of it. And, and, and a really big one is, is the rotting of organic material, particularly garbage, particularly food waste. So when food is, is, is wasted and it goes to a landfill, that landfill 
every day is usually covered with dirt designed so that water and oxygen don't get into it. And as it breaks down without air, it creates methane. And that methane ultimately goes up into the atmosphere. So that's 25 times um, the amount. Uh, the third largest gas is nitrous oxide. Um, that's about 300 times more impactful than CO2. It's, it's not a very big prevalent gas. I think uh, laughing gas, doctors use it, dentists use it. Um, there are, it, it's, it's an off gas and some other chemical reactions. And then um, the fourth one uh, is uh, hydrofluorocarbons or HFCs. So in your air conditioning, probably in your home, air conditioning probably in your car, possibly in, um, in your refrigerators. Uh, it, is a, it is a chemical gas that basically when you, when you compress it and expand it, that phase change is what creates cool. Uh, it's a great refrigerant. And really, it's a, you know, I'll take a step back and say that, the, that um, you've all heard of the hole in the ozone layer. And the hole in the ozone layer uh, really started around Antarctica um, and is exp expanded. And it was, I think it was discovered in about 1984. And, and basically that, that ozone layer really helps protect our skin. That filters out a lot of the UV rays. Well, uh, the gas CFC, which was very much used for refrigerants um, and for propellants, for deodorant and those kind of hairspray, those kind of things, uh, were from that gas. There was a great international uh, treaty called the Montreal Protocol that, that addressed that and, and got the world to commit to phase out of CFCs. The chemical industry came up with a solution and they created hydrofluorocarbons. A great solution in the fact that it didn't create, it didn't have any impact on the hole in the ozone layer, but it had that big impact on climate. And so um, really one of the most uh, impactful things that I got lucky to work on in my career is I was a part of the team of three or four people that convinced the Coca-Cola company in uh, the year 2000 to phase out of the use of HFCs for refrigerant use. And, and Coca-Cola, the system around the world is, is the largest buyer of refrigeration equipment, buying over a million pieces per year. Um, and we did, we did the math and figured out that um, it was a pretty big impact. And we worked with our engineers over time and figured out a way to make our equipment 40 to 50% more energy efficient and also phase out of that, um, that gas. So um, if you look in uh, the Coca-Cola company's annual um, carbon disclosure project that they submit to share owners every year and investors, um, You'll see as a result of that program that, that my, my colleagues and I worked on, uh, we're saving Coke customers about $400 million a year in energy charges. And um, we have phased out of that uh, refrigerant for um, 90 plus percent of the new equipment that Coke buys every year, which is about, um, it, it's, it works out to about 900 to a million pieces of equipment every year. Um, unfortunately, the rest of the world, the, the car air conditioners, the domestic refrigerators, the, the big uses in places like grocery stores are a bit behind and they're just starting to address this. Um, it, uh, it's the new treaty on that is called the Kigali um, Treaty. And um, that is just starting to kick in the, uh, into place. Unfortunately, I think that we, the, that indus the rest of the industries really should have phased out probably 10 years ago. Um, we start, Coke started 22, 23 years ago on it, but it, it does make quite a, quite, a big, quite a big difference. Now, let me talk a little bit about, about, about us. The, the most impactful thing that we all can do um, with regards to climate change um, is, is not to use energy in the first place, or, or let's call it a, a negawa, or, or it's how can you be more efficient? So that's, that's carpooling, that's turning out the lights, that's not leaving your, your um, equipment, everything plugged in. So if you leave, if you're leaving a bunch of things plugged in, your cell phone charger, uh, different things that you only use occasionally, uh, there's a kind of a nickname that's that for it. I, I think it's a, sort of like vampire power. Um, it's sucking all, it's sucking a little bit of power all the time, even when you're not using those things. So, so looking around for things that you can do um, to reduce energy use is great. 
that, that but efficiency really is the, the, the biggest thing that, that we can do. Um, another really big thing that you can do too is reduce the amount of red meat that you eat in your diet. Um, that's, that's, that's um, people that are vegans or that are vegetarians typically have a much lower carbon footprint. A, a, a meat eater like me um, has a fairly big house. I'm generating about 20 tons of CO2 a year. Um, but it's, it's, it's very easy for someone to get to, to under 10 tons a year. Chris, uh, people in, in Thailand are probably, their, their numbers are probably like four tons uh, per person per year. Um, lots of mass transit, um, very tightly packed together. Um, so another thing you can do is um, if you buy electricity or natural gas from a, a, util a local utility, oftentimes those utilities will, will allow you to buy green power from them. Um, they typically charge a bit of an upcharge, and, um, but they, they, you can buy it in blocks. And a lot of times it's not that expensive. And I know Aaron in, in Southern California, S Southern California Edison's program is really, really um, cost effective. So for a couple of bucks extra a month, you can, you can significantly increase the amount of green power that you're essentially buying. And what it's doing it's providing what's known as additionality. It's helping create more capacity of wind and solar and geothermal, those kind of things. Um, and also to help fund efficiency, efficiency efforts. Um, and then kind of the last thing that you can do is, is buy, buy offsets. Now it's a little bit like an, an indulgence, um, but there are some really great programs that are uh, that, that you can participate in, and at the end I'll I'll talk a little bit more about one. But um, there, there are tree planting programs. There are programs that that capture uh, landfill gas. There are programs that help add capacity on solar that you can you can buy. So every year for my business, I I buy offsets to offset my my travel um, and basically the energy that's used to run my little my little business and. I think last year it was like it was 350 bucks or something like that to be able to just off, to offset through through a program. So lo lots of things that you can do in that space. I'm going to take a breath and see if anybody has any questions on 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 climate. All right. The, 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 the next big area I want to talk about is, is waste prevention. If you look at the typical Western lifestyle, a, it, it takes 71 pounds of material that gets extracted from the Earth's crust every single day to support our lifestyles. So that, that's the, the, the petroleum that's used to make this bottle. It's the fiber that makes the it's the food, it's, it's all the resources. It's an incredible amount, 71 pounds per person per day. And only about 9% of that is what I would call circular, that it's being reused or recycled or composted. Only 9% of that. So there's a huge amount of waste that's generated by what, and a lot of it you, you, don't, you don't see, but it's when you, when you think about this piece of paper, and what it takes to make this, how many trees it takes, all the related waste to it, it's, it's, it's really um, kind of astonishing. Um, the recycling rate in the US is about 35%. It hasn't really changed that much in a long time, but probably 75% of the waste that we generate, at least at home or at work, is recyclable or compostable. Um, I'm guaranteed that in, in Thailand, the recycling rate's higher. It's probably, 50% at least. Um, just uh, there's, there's a, a much more mature, what I would call scavenger um, culture where people, anything that gets, get, they, lots of, there's, there's people that make their living by living on a landfill and taking stuff out. There are people that are, that, that are going through bags. They're picking up stuff off the streets and, and, and selling it. Um, so the recycling rates usually in, in developing nations are higher than, than, uh, than in countries like, like, like the US. Um, why is the recycle rate so low in the US? Part of the reason is um, about 40% of people don't have ac convenient access to recycling. 
And then the ones that do have convenient access typically do get involved with what I call um, um, wish cycling. They, they think that, okay, well, this is plastic, this pen, I'm gonna put it in the recycling bin. Um, I, you know, I'm gonna put, this doesn't work anymore, it's plastic, I'm, put, I'm putting it in the bin. Oh, I've got this tin, I've got this aluminum foil um, and this, I got this salad and it's in this foil dish, I'm gonna, I'm, and it's got a bunch of food in it, but I'm putting it in the bin. I've got all this greasy paper, I'm putting it in the bin. It creates it creates contamination, and in the end, somebody or some machine has to sort that stuff sort that stuff out. One of the one of the worst things that you can put if you have curbside recycling at your home, one of the worst things you can put in there is is a plastic bag. Those plastic bags end up getting wound up in equipment, breaking breaking all the sorting equipment. It's it's really um, a challenge for recyclers. Um, Another thing that's important for individuals and, and, and companies to think about is buying recycling. So look for opportunities to, to, to where you can buy things that have recycled content in them. I'm not wearing a Consequence of Habit shirt today because I'm wearing a shirt that's made from 16 20 ounce plastic bottles. So polyester is the same plastic as a Coke bottle and it makes great fiber. And so one of the things I worked on with Coke was to try to get our bottlers to have their uniforms made from, from recycled plastic bottles. Uh, in Japan, they, they, they've done it for years, probably decades, where the entire kit that the, 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 the route drivers and the, the guys that worked in the factory were made from, from recycled bottles. So looking at opportunities to, uh, to buy recycled is um, uh, a, a real, a real good, good idea. One of, the, one of the biggest opportunities and one of the, the, I think one of the biggest problems that we have uh, with regards to waste is, is food waste. About 40% of, of the food that's grown in the United States doesn't make it into people's bellies for, as calories. It gets wasted somewhere along the supply chain, maybe wasted at the farm, at the processor, at the grocery store, 17% of a typical restaurant meal is wasted. It goes, in, it goes in the bin. And then you've got all the waste that happens at home. You bought, you bought bread and it got mold. Berries and, 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 and it got, uh, they got moldy, those, those kind of things. That, that's an incredible amount of waste. On average, per person per year, wastes $1,600 in food that gets, that gets wasted. And now we've talked about water and greenhouse gases. <clears throat> 4% of all the greenhouse gases in the world comes from food waste. 18% of the food waste is, so if you look at all the crops that are out there, that are, that are so on the cropland, 18% of that becomes food waste. 24% of what goes in a landfill is food waste. And 4% percent of the fresh water we use is in food waste. So it had food waste has this huge impact. Food waste creates methane, has that that's where that greenhouse gas bit comes from, plus all of the fertilizer that's used, the waste of water, the waste of land. It's it's really an incredible um, an incredible issue. Now there's there's great opportunities out there. There's there's food dates, food donation programs. There are, there are several um, apps that uh, around organizations have around, around the world. I know that um, one is called um, Too Good to Waste. I believe that's an international one. There's another one called Olio, it's O-L-I-O. -O. There's uh, one based here in Atlanta called Gooder. A lot of times what these, these organizations are doing is going particularly to food service outlets, manufacturers or restaurants and trying to get material that is a day old or that they've made too much and they, and they, they, they can't sell it. Um, and so they'll work with them to sell it at a discounted rate um, or capture it and get it to people in need. I, I may have left this out, but in the US, one in eight people are food insecure. That means a couple of times a week, they, they don't know, they're going to bed hungry. Um, so we're wasting 40% and we've got one in eight that are, that are food insecure huge opportunity to, 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 to try to do something. Um, the last area that I'll talk about with regards to waste 
is around um, is around litter. And when you look at look at litter, whether it's roadside litter when you're out out cycling or running or walking, um, about twenty percent of that litter is accidental. It, it's something that fell out of somebody's pocket by mistake, or um, you set out your recycling bin and, and it rains and some of the stuff get, or it's windy. Some of the stuff gets blown out and it ends up in, in the gutter and goes down, it goes down, down the sewer. Um, but 80% of it is on purpose. And typically it's, it's 16 to 21 year old males. Um, but it's not exclusive. Um, and, and it, it's usually, there's a concept called the broken window theory. So when people see a pile of trash, they're, they're almost, um, they feel even emboldened to just throw more crap uh, on the ground. Um, luckily, there's, there's all kinds of activities that we can do to, 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 to try to pick it up. Um, Consequence of Habit has done a, a plogging uh, event. I know there's going to be another one around Earth Day, which is on April 22nd, which is basically combining running, walking, and, and picking up litter. Um, and I read this someplace, and, and I think it's a, it's a really interesting thought that um, when we're in our East and we see litter, we actually should have a moral obligation to do something about it, to pick it up, to report it. Um, so, uh, and it's, you know, it does impact uh, on property values. Um, we certainly need to do more on the education side and the more, the, more on, on, the, on the pickup side um, as well. So Chris, why don't we go to, to that last slide, which is just a, a list of some resources. Um, if you're looking for a place to recycling something, if it's an aluminum can, if it's some sort of oddball thing, uh, there's a, the website earth911.com has a, a great recycling locator. So you can, so Jenna, if you, you had, um, let's say you had a bunch of uh, um, uh, Tetra box, uh, uh, protein drink boxes, that you wanted to get rid of. You, you type in media PA and you might be able to find some local place to get rid of it or whether your local recycling program uh, accept it. I, I'm sure that probably at least half of us um, online here has an old phone in a drawer at home that, uh, that you're not using. Uh, Gazelle.com will may buy that phone. Um, it, there's usually a lot of, there you go. It's full of heavy metals. It's full of gold and platinum. Um, that are valuable. In fact, the um, in Japan in the Tokyo Olympics last year, all the all the medals were made from the metals inside. So the the gold, the silver, and the bronze were from from old recycled uh, electronics, which is which is pretty cool. Now Walmart, Staples, Office Depot all have programs as well where you can where you can go and, and donate them. Gazelle's the one that I know that consistently where where they'll they will if it's a reasonably um, new phone in decent working order they'll buy it from you they and they 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 wipe it clean and then they they're reselling it it's a pretty good uh, pretty good use uh, I think I mentioned too good to go uh, that's that's a, an up and coming international um, donation effort I didn't really talk about composting. That's something if you if um, if you have any little bit of property, um, taking your food scraps and your food waste, not meat, but any organic material, any uh, vegetable scrapings or leftover uh, moldy fruit, those kind of things, um, you can compost that stuff. It makes really great um, soil amendment. Uh, General and Joshua and JT will laugh about this. Um, I convinced my dad back in the the late '80s. To, uh, to do his own compost pile in the backyard. And he didn't have anything but a pile and a, and a pit, pitchfork. And you just have to go about, out and turn it once in a while. Uh, unfortunately, Yellow Jackets built the hive and he got, ended up getting stung about 10 times <laughs> one time. But um, you, you, there's bins for sale, but it's a very, very easy thing. But if you want sort of 101 resources on how to really do composting or uh, uh, do a worm bin, the uh, uh, NC State University has, uh, has really, really great, great resources. Um, the carbon fund, if you wanna measure your carbon footprint, it gives you, it's got some formulas there that you can plug in based on where you live, the size of uh, the place you live in, all those kind of things. 
to, to do an estimate on your carbon footprint. And then if you wanted to offset part of that or offset your business travel or your personal travel, um, it, it gives you different options on, on, on being able to, to offset those, uh, uh, those emissions. Um, the next one is a, is a great database. Uh, it's a US database of, of federal, state and local incentives and tax deductions that are available for energy efficient equipment. Um, so there are a lot of utilities that offer uh, LED lighting at a, at a reduced cost. Or if you buy them, you can submit the receipt and get um, a bit of a rebate for it. Energy Star products, anything that's listed as Energy Star is probably gonna be 25% more, more energy efficient than a competing product. Um, I think I mentioned the EPA water sense and all these have links. And then the last one, um, there's a great organization in Charleston called uh, Water Mission. There are all kinds of great organizations that, that, that provide clean drinking water um, in, in disaster response or just chronic issues. And Water Mission is one of the best. Uh, they know how to, how to use local resources, local equipment, and be able to, to uh, develop a sustainable good, healthy drinking water program that also includes what we call WASH. Um, and WASH is, is, is really, it, it's the hygiene part of things as well. Um, if, you, if you have clean drinking water, but you don't have good hygiene, you're still gonna have issues with foodborne illness and diarrhea and things like that. So Water Mission is a great organization. In fact, when the, the Russian war started uh, with the invasion of, of Ukraine, I checked out their website and within like the second or third day, they had people from Charleston that had flown to Poland and that were, were on the border ready to start setting up um, uh, drinking water resources uh, there. It's, it's sort of like um, World City Kitchen um, and, and th their ability to be there so fast to help. So those are some resources for you. I'm happy to, to, to uh, take any questions or comments. Hey, Jeff, as far as if someone was to come to you and say, hey, um, I, there's, if, if I can make one change today or tomorrow that, that is going to have the most impact, most bang for the buck, um, which one of those would you, would you say would, would you would suggest? On, 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 in all three of the areas? Yeah, I mean, some of them as far as... Uh, um, I'm trying to think as far as the gases and stuff, I, I, I'm trying to think, all right, what, what can we get buy-in on? What, what can people really wrap their, their head around and, and, and understand it in a, in a fairly quick uh, basis that yes, this is going to make a difference uh, now. I think it, it, it's a great question. I mean, probably the quickest, bigger, biggest bang for your buck is if you're a meat eater to reduce the amount of the, the amount of meat, meat that you eat. That's probably the, the the simplest thing that you could do. Um, I, you know, the other thing is, I think that is just to to think about every everything that you buy. Um, you know, is is there is there if I bought it in bulk, is that going to save on packaging, um, or do I, you know, is so? I think just just sort of starting to put the environmental lens on the things that you do. And is there is there a better is there a better way to do it? I, I know you that, uh, here in media they've really gotten on board with trying to compost, where you can sign up and they'll provide you a bucket, and once a week you put your bucket out, and somebody will come along and collect your bucket, and it goes to the local farm. You know, which Jen, I would I would say. I would say that's probably the, the other thing that you can do is if you've got any little space where somebody picks it up is to compost that, that organic waste. The dirt is amazing. It only needs one year to break down to till you can use it. And you get the most amazing volunteer plants when you use it the next year. Oh, it's right outside my window here. And we now, I don't know how it's happening because it's, it's totally enclosed, but there's now, there's a cabbage plant growing in it. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's big and it's green. It's a little yeah. pale, but it's amazing that it's, gro it's growing in there. I, I barely, I never plant squash anymore because it always comes up. 
I never, I don't know how, I don't know why, but it does. So, and with a huge composter, and it's great to see different townships. So if you live in a township um, that doesn't yet have it, I know that there are farms that would love to have that compost. Yeah. Thanks, Aaron. Aaron had to run. I know uh, some, some, for example, uh, one of my clients, he's an iron chef here in Philadelphia and recognizing that food is going to waste, uh, pr namely produce. And we live in Philadelphia. So there are children that are not learning how to cook using fresh produce. So he takes children and uh, teaches children how to cook healthfully with foods that are going to be tossed, um, whether it be the grocery stores, it's, it's past the expiration date, or it, you know, it's being replaced that day, or farmers markets aren't selling it, they donate their food. Uh, he has a team of chefs that create, create recipes, and they go out to the school districts and teach kids how to cook using fresh donated ingredients. Yeah, that's awesome. One, one of the, probably the, the most progressive person that I ever worked with at Coke um, was a Brit named Jake Bacchus and, and Jake for he has two sons and his wife they bought everything secondhand Every, everything clothing vehicles um, it was it was just it was he really was impressed he I mean he put solar on his house and he bought secondhand solar panels yeah. the guy just he just let somebody else spend the money on it first and then he fixed it or, or he got something that just somebody wasn't using anymore. It, it was, it's amazing how he's, he's, he's done that. And he bikes all over the place. And he had, he actually had converted, he had a VW um, van type of thing. And, and he can, it was diesel and he converted it to, to run on French fry oil, on waste oil. So there's, if you if you really want to go overboard, <laughs> you, it's amazing. Kaylee, how are you? I'm well. How are you? Sorry, I jumped on a little late. No worries. What 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 do you have in Booz Allen that's 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 environmentally friendly? Oh, it's a fantastic question. I'm really not uh, in tune with the whole. I'm at client site, so I'm not really. Uh, I work for a government client. I'm not really too in tune um, with Booz Allen, but that's definitely something I want to look into. Well, certainly your client site, they've probably got all kinds of, of things going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, they're moving to some of our buildings. Uh, it's kind of hard because they have to stay secure, but I know that they've been talking about solar panels um, mm -hmm. and wanting to use um, that for um, energy. And as far as um, when they're building new buildings, um, they're definitely taking in um, sustainability um, into it. Um, I think that composting is definitely something they're also working towards. Um, so that's, that's cool to see something in the government working towards that. Um, it's definitely reassuring. Very cool. Matthew, how about uh, in Virginia? Um, <clears throat> I don't notice much in Virginia, to be honest, but that just might be not, uh, that might just be me not um, picking my head up out of the weeds at work and, and looking around, still driving trucks. And uh, Virginians, especially Virginia Beach and the military, love our trucks. And uh, I don't know, that's all I have to say about that, really. Well, you know, I think the, the big energy supplier there, Dominion Resources, is probably in the top eight as far as trying to develop more uh, renewable capacity. And I, I think they're one of the few um, that have, have kind of made a commitment to get out of, get at least out of coal in the next 10 years. Most of the, the cheapest... The, the cheapest new energy um, generation capacity now um, in, in the U.S. is is wind and solar. It's it's cheaper than than coal and natural gas. My uh, uh, one of my clients is is um, going to be putting solar panels on um, a hundred thousand foot 
excuse me, a million square foot warehouse um, and their headquarters building and also a new, a new production facility that they have. Um, so there's lot, lots of, and they're gonna have a decent payback, probably four or five years. Is his name Elon? What's that? Is his name Elon? <laughs> no, no, it is not. <laughs> Um, I did just remember that at um, at our client site, they're planning um, the whole government client um, or agency is planning on um, in the next five years. There's um, it's actually just been signed that they're um, decommissioning all of the car our government cars that they have, um, and they're moving um, totally towards electric. So there'll be complete electric cars, um, and that's huge because there's like three thousand vehicles just within yeah. this government agency. So yeah, that's great. Hey, very hey, Jeff. Good. I'm just, I'm just gonna. Uh, I just wanted to uh, let you know. I'm gonna, I'm actually gonna end the recording now. Um, okay. And we, we can get into the discussion. Just because I said I was gonna do sure. it. I'll do it. Thanks. Thanks for a great presentation, Jeff.